Welcome to our second Sunday of Lent service to those who are present in the building and those who are joining us online. We begin today with the penitential order found on page 319. Bless the Lord who forgiveth all our sins. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now on page 324. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from thy ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of thy word, Jesus Christ, thy Son, who with thee and the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. reading from the book of Genesis. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless. And the heir of my house of Abizar and of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house shall be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord. And the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ar to the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? 
He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat that is three years old, a ram that is three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half again, over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the caucus, Adam drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell over Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Ephesus. Here endeth the reading. Psalm 27 is found on page 617 in your Red Book of Common Prayer. Please join me after the asterisk. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom then shall I be afraid? When evildoers do, evil come upon me to eat of my flesh, it was they, my foes and my adversaries, who stumbled and fell. Though any army shall encamp me against me, yet my heart shall not be And though war shall raise up against me, yet I put my trust in him. One thing I have asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the fair beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he shall keep me safe in his shelter, shall hide me in the secrets of his dwelling, and set me high upon the rock. Even now he lifts up my head, above my enemies in the earth. Therefore I will offer in his dwelling an oblation with the sounds of great gladness. Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me, he answered. You speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Hide not your face from me. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Though my father and my mother forsake me, show me your way, O Lord. Deliver me not into the land of my adversaries, who falls wish to against me, and also. What if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord? O oh, tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Be strong, and he shall comfort your heart. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Here end the reading. The Holy 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finished my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Why are people in the Bible told not to be afraid when they have a vision of God or an angel visits them? Why does Jesus tell his followers not to be afraid? What comes after these words of assurance? Usually, it's to go do something unexpected and difficult. In the reading from Genesis today, Abram had a vision, and God started by telling him not to be afraid. In Matthew 28, the women encounter the angel at the tomb and were told not to be afraid. Then they encounter Jesus, who also tells them not to be afraid. In Luke 1, the angel of the Lord tells Mary not to be afraid. Would God give that instruction and assurance if each of those people was not responding in fear? Brene Brown is a research professor in the field of social work who has spent two decades studying and writing about courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. Her, TED talk, her TEDx talk, The Power of Vulnerability, has been viewed more than 57 million times. In her recent book, Atlas of the Heart, she does a deep dive into human emotion. She says, 15 years ago, when we first introduced a curriculum based on my shame resilience research, we asked participants in the training workshops to list all the emotions that they could recognize and name as they were experiencing them. Over the course of five years, we collected these surveys for more than 7,000 people. The average number of emotions named across the surveys was three. The emotions were happy, sad, and angry. Fear is not in that list. Yet fear is prevalent in the world. If we cannot define what fear is and what it feels like, how do we follow the instruction not to be afraid? Are things we call fear actually fear? Or are they something else that we are not sure how to name? Brown defines fear as a, a response to a threat in the present, a negative, short-lasting, high alert emotion in response to a perceived threat that often results in fight, flight, or freeze responses. When we look back at the Genesis, Luke, and Matthew examples of people in the Bible being told not to be afraid in the framework of this definition, the encounters take on a different feel. 
Do not be afraid is an assurance that they are not in immediate danger, that they do not need to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. These fear responses would not be good because the message that people were receiving asked that they hear and then take some sort of action. It's really hard to truly hear a message when we are locked into fear. I do not know about you, but I use the word fear for a lot larger scope of experiences. Have you ever seen an emotions wheel? The colorful round diagram? Usually it's got at least, seems like 10,000 colors on it. It's a little overwhelming. In the center, it's, generally it starts with seven basic emotions. And it helps us figure out more specific emotions as each ring is expanded out. Happy, sad, and angry are three of the central emotions, which are the three that people were able to name. The others are surprised, bad, fearful, and disgusted. Now, something that you might not know about me is that I am a big fan of animated movies. DreamWorks, Disney, Pixar, Studio Ghibli, I love them. So surprise, surprise, it's movie time. Joy, sadness, anger, disgust, and fear are the characters who make up the mind of the child Riley in the 2015 Pixar animated movie Inside Out. It may be pretty simplified, but it does a really good job of demonstrating that all the emotions have an important role in who we are, that they all interact with one another, and they may not seem to be good emotions, but emotions are just emotions. They are what they are, and they all are important. By the end, the characters in this movie discover that when they are experienced together, they create an even broader range of emotions to describe Riley's experience of the world. Do not be afraid. Do not react in fear by impulsively fighting, running away, or freezing up and doing nothing. If the emotion we get when we look at the future is not fear, what is it? I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this because I'm really not. But I will read a little bit from Brene Brown's book because she is the expert. This book is a little different than her other ones in that it's, it is really an atlas called Atlas of the Heart. I'm going to read a little bit from the anxiety section. She says, for me, anxiety feels like what I lovingly call the Willy Wonka tunnel. She adds another word in there, but uh, I want this to be family friendly. There's a frightening scene in the original Willy Wonka film that starts out as a sweet boat ride through a magical land of supersized candy and turns into an escalating scene of fear and loss of control. As the boat enters a dark tunnel, the mood turns. The boat starts going faster and faster with terrible images flashing on the walls, including a close-up of a millipede crawling over someone's face, a chicken getting its head cut off, and a lizard eating a bug. None of it makes narrative sense. It's just scary and confusing. All of this is happening while the passengers, children, and their parents are freaking out, and Willy Wonka, played by the incredible wild-eyed Gene Wilder, is maniacally reciting a poem at an increasingly frenetic rate. If you haven't seen the movie, you don't know what that poem is, but I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, and I'm certainly not going to sing it to you. But you're welcome to uh, look it up or ask to see it after the service. She says, that's what anxiety feels like to me. 
escalating loss of control, worst case scenario thinking and imagery, and total uncertainty. To me, that sounds more like how I feel sometimes when I'm looking into the future. But she also goes on to say that as her and her team reviewed the research, what she learned about language and how some of these experiences work together, they felt like a life jacket for her, something that would keep her afloat if she had to jump off the boat before it headed into that tunnel. Identifying our emotions can give us language to help us process what's happening to us. We worry. And worry is the thinking part of anxiety. A chain of negative thoughts about bad things that might happen in the future. Well, that links to the Willy Wonka tunnel, too. People might think that fear makes them weak. That's a lie. It doesn't. But then when we turn to anxiety, that's a whole other can of worms. Now we are into an emotion that still seems pretty taboo in our society. We do not want to be perceived as hang having anxiety because people might think we are broken, which is also a lie does not. So we might be tempted to think, let's just respond like we do to fear because we're not broken. Fight, flight, freeze. Don't think, just react. Not a good idea in most circumstances. Fight, flight, and freeze. Leave little space for compassion, patience, and constructive action. If we are not in immediate danger, we do not need to be afraid. If we are anxious, that can be coped with. If we acknowledge our emotions, we're vulnerable. If we are not careful, taking a step into allowing ourselves to be vulnerable can set off a fear cycle and perhaps even more anxiety because we do not know how to be vulnerable. So it must be a bad thing, right? Another lie. It's not. Seeing the world through the lenses of fear and anxiety make us see the worst in every situation. It can also make us physically ill. Some situations used to put me into a spiral of fear, dread, and anxiety and it wreaked havoc on my life. With a lot of work, I have learned to recognize physical sensations in my body that are associated with my emotions long before they can become an out of control problem. I can much more easily move through these emotions when I can recognize and name what is happening. Yet. Brene Brown's research shows that most people cannot name what they are feeling. No wonder we as humanity so often feel out of control. There are three things that Brene Brown began discovering as a child and still finds to be true. And I, when reading them, also find them to be pretty true. She says that these three things are the biggest barriers to developing brave leaders or cultivating courage in families or bringing justice to communities. First, people will do almost anything not to feel pain, including causing pain and abusing power. Second, very few people can handle being held accountable without rationalizing blaming, or shutting down. And third, without understanding how our feelings, thoughts, and behaviors work together, it's almost impossible to find our way back to ourselves and each other when we don't understand how our emotions shape our thoughts and decisions. 
we become disembodied from our own experiences and disconnected from each other. What does all this talk of emotion mean for us? Not just as human beings, but as followers of Christ. Let's look at the example that Jesus gives us. Do anything to avoid pain. Uh, no. Jesus showed us that feeling pain cannot be avoided. And like many others, taught that everyone should do to others what they would like to be done to themselves and not create more pain for anyone, even to get ourselves out of it. In his encounters with others, Jesus held them accountable for their actions. He taught his followers to be accountable for in their words and deeds. I always like bringing Peter into things like this, because Peter was the one who sometimes did and said things that didn't really work with what the ministry was. And Jesus held him accountable. Remember after the resurrection, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And he made him repeat three times that he loves him. Why? Because he had denied him. He was holding him accountable and helping him to learn to take responsibility for what he said and to move forward. Jesus connected with people and wanted us all to be connected with him, one another, and ourselves, which is not possible if we can't figure out what is going on in our head, our heart, and our gut. Is it okay to feel all these emotions? Look at the Psalms. I have not tried it, but I have a feeling that any emotion that comes up in one of those emotion wheels can be found somewhere in the Psalms. The psalmist shows us that all the feels are part of who we are as humans and that we can share all of it with our Creator. When we figure out how to put words to our emotions, we can help others to do the same being able to recognize some of the chaos going on inside ourselves gives us all more tools to offer grace to ourselves and to others. When we can offer grace, we can also offer love. And when we offer the gifts of both grace and love, we are offering a glimpse of God. Because what is God? God is love. Amen. We continue on page 326 with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Well,
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, to Church of our Savior Milford and the Anglican Church of Melanesia, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Praying this week for Randy, Tamar, Jared, Joshua Roberts, Denise Roberts Topliff, Frank and Linda Rosano, Eric and Teresa Ro- Rosenberger, Ann Rosalot, Jessica, Michael, Sophia and Everly Rue, Benjamin, Ryan, Gwyneth and Reese Roy, David and Mary Rudig, Mary, Mike and Barbara Rudig, Bob Sampson and Brad Decker. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Fran, Peg, Ashley, Jarrett, Tamar, Randy, Deborah, Dot, Sandy, Pat, Lori, Jean, and John and all those in this transitory life that are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Jane Arada and Mary Lou Russ. And for those in whose memory a memorial donation was given, the Reverend Dr. Alan Monroe, and Lieutenant Colonel Ronit Warner, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Lord, today we also remember those who have died as a result of the war in Ukraine. And we pray for all those who have the power to end war, to bring peace, to save lives instead of taking them. We pray that all may come together instead of tearing one another apart. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Welcome again to everyone. You will notice on the back of your service sheet that some of the announcements are there at the bottom on the back, so I'm not going to repeat those because you all have them in your hands. And those online, you can find the service sheet online as well. Additional things, coffee hour is back. We do ask that those who participate in in-person coffee hour be vaccinated. And that when you are getting your donuts, other treats, coffee, you remain masked. If you are talking near those items, remain masked. If you want to take your mask off, back away from the food. COVID or not, no one wants you talking over the food. Next Sunday, those of you who have youth who are your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor's kids, your friend's kids, after the 10 o'clock service, actually at about noon, I will be gathering with the youth for pizza and games in the upper parish hall. I would love to see and meet and have some fun with any and all youth of this congregation and friends of this congregation. Kate will be on sabbatical for her first half of sabbatical, the 28th of March through the 14th of May. So if you need something from her, you better ask before that because we're not letting her check email while she's gone. You'll notice that that time includes Easter. Well, we get Bishop Rob from Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday, including the Triduum. So, yeah, we don't get Kate, but we do get the Bishop. So, I invite you all to bring yourself with joy to those services as we come together this year for Easter. It will be my first Easter in person here, so I'm really excited about that. I know we usually just do birthdays for everyone the first Sunday of the month, but I hear we have a birthday today that's pretty special. We have an 80th birthday today. That would be Barb Warner. So happy birthday to Barb. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you and before I suffer. 
three, two, one. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe. You bring forth bread from the earth. You have fed us with the bread of life in the body of your Son. Feed us now with your presence among us and your presence in your word. As grain scattered upon the earth is gathered into one loaf, so gather your church in every place into the kingdom of your Son. To you be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe. You create the fruit of the vine, and you refresh us with the cup of salvation in the body of Jesus Christ, crucified yet risen. May the time come quickly when we can share that cup again, even as you are with us now in our very thirst for you. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you now to share with me the agape meal. Generous God, we have shared together this sacred meal. Kindle us with the fire of your spirit, that when Christ comes again, we may shine like lights before his face, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.